If you can remain standing just for a moment as we read from Acts chapter 2, which reads the following. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues as of fire appeared on them and rested on each one of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And then to verse 17, verse 16, but it was, but this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh and your sons and daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and my female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The word of the Lord. Praise be to God. Now please be seated. Well, if you're there in Acts chapter 2, uh, we're going to be looking at uh, through Acts 1 and 2. Now, I'm not one for walking, um, but one thing I did notice when I was growing up, if I was taking on a walk, that I always hoped that the last corner that I saw was going to be the last corner. There is nothing worse than walking up to that corner and realizing that you have another straight road ahead of that, only to be followed by another corner. Very similar with hills. There's nothing more discouraging than climbing to the top of, another, of one hill only to find that there's one more beyond that that you have to climb to get to where you are going. Well, in the same way, Pentecost, or at least leading up to Pentecost, there is both this expectation and then, of course, a flattening. There is the greatness of Pentecost, and yet at the same time, there is the question that's only asked once, as far as I understand in the New Testament, never asked again. And that question almost shapes the book of Acts, at least in how the Spirit of God answers it. And we'll get to that in a moment. But one of the things I want us to recognize this morning is that Pentecost is not an afterthought of God. It is not as if this is just consequential of Christ's life, death, and resurrection. It certainly is because of that. But Pentecost is foreshadowed like many other events are in the Old Testament that point to Christ. Of course, when we think of Christ's death, when we think of the images used of Christ's death in the Old Testament, and then how John uses such images, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, the only way we can know that that is speaking of Christ is if we understand the Old Testament language and, of course, what that language addressed, the old sacrificial system. The point here is to recognize that God has a very beautiful way of sowing seeds in the past that then bear fruit in the future, of foreshadowing what he's going to do before he actually does it in fullness. Jesus, of course, in John chapter 16, when teaching his disciples, said that the Holy Spirit would come and that when the Holy Spirit came, uh, he would convict the world of sin, righteousness, and the judgment to come. But the Holy Spirit would also be a comforter 
because the world that we will go out into is a world filled with tribulation, but be assured because Jesus Christ has overcome the world. This is the benchmark, that Christ has overcome the world. There is no battle to be fought as though the victory is yet to be determined. The victory is already Christ. The battle has already been won in that sense. Christ has overcome the world, and those in Christ overcome the world. And the Spirit of God brings both the conviction of this truth and, of course, the empowering to be witnesses of Christ. The point that we are to recognize here this morning is that the disciples are being prepared for what is about to come in John 16, and that when the Spirit of God comes, they will be witnesses of Christ to the ends of the world. And this preparation is necessary so that they can understand the reason for the coming of God the Holy Spirit. Christ must go, the Spirit must come, and the Spirit does many other things than what are mentioned just in the day of Pentecost. The Spirit is a comforter, and I think that if you are being told that the person that you have followed for three and a half years is going to go to the cross, is going to um, die, rise from the dead, and then ascend into heaven, the sense of comfort that you would need that Christ is no longer going to be with you is one that is clearly understood by all of us. And so God being with us in the person of the Holy Spirit is what is promised and, of course, is what happens. Interestingly, Jesus says earlier in John 14 that they, the disciples, that is, and those who follow, will be able to do greater works than Christ, which seems strange because I've never walked on water. I've never caused a man to rise from the dead. Um, I have seen people by the, by the person and work of the Holy Spirit receive wonderful healings and, and wonderful turnarounds in their life because God is at work. But I myself have, have, have not been able to walk on what I'd love to, especially here in Minnesota. I think it'd be a real advantage. Um, but the point is I've not been able to do it. So how are we to understand this phrase, greater works, if it is not really greater in power, if it is not to go beyond what Jesus has done? Well, of course, I think this is explained wonderfully well in the book of Acts, that the greater works that Jesus speaks of in John 14 is really pointing to the greater works of extent, of the gospel going out into the world, not just remaining in Jerusalem. And so the extent of the work of God through the people of God will permeate the world. And I think this is really what Jesus is addressing. And so the church uh, is never meant to have understood that the gift of the Holy Spirit is somehow a power that they are given to use at their own discretion, as though somehow I can dictate and control. No, no. The Spirit of God hears and does. But the Spirit of God doesn't hear us, well, in prayer, of course, but what the Spirit does, he does what he hears. And this is what Jesus actually teaches. And the Spirit of God is then given to us to be filled with power, to be witnesses of God in a world um, that doesn't believe that Christ has overcome it, that doesn't believe that Christ has overcome the world and those in Christ have overcome the world. And so you have been given the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost and here now to be witnesses. But the interesting thing is, is how the day of Pentecost is led up to, and this is where I want to begin in Acts chapter 1. Just look at verse 3 with me if you have your Bibles. In verse 3, it says that Jesus had suffered many proofs, appearing for 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And so it's interesting to note that uh, how well Jesus is actually listened to. I mean, you would imagine that if Jesus has suffered many proofs for 40 days, been speaking about the kingdom of God for 40 days, that you wouldn't have any questions concerning the kingdom of God. But then look at verse 6. The one question that they ask Jesus is this. 
Lord, will you now at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Odd. I find it odd. I find that if Jesus has been teaching about this subject for 40 days, that there wouldn't be a need for the question. And so the question is, why do they even ask this question? Well, interestingly, I believe that this question is answered even though Jesus tells them that it's not for them to know the time and the seasons that the Lord has fixed, yet nonetheless, it's a bit like this road with the corners, that throughout time, we're going to see the unfolding of God's kingdom through the church and on earth, that God's will, as it is done in heaven, will be done on earth. And just like we overcome one hill, we overcome another, and we get to see more and more and more. And this question, once is asked in chapter 1, is never asked again. As far as I understand, at least if I've read my Bible correctly, it is never asked again. And I think the reason being is because it doesn't need to be asked again. Because suddenly, with the work of the Spirit, we begin to understand both the Lord's Prayer, that the will of God will be done on earth as it is in heaven, that God's kingdom is, has come and is coming in its fullness, and as we walk with Christ throughout this world, we get to see more and more and more of that fullness throughout time. That's why I think the question is never raised again. And so the point is to recognize that the Spirit of God in the book of Acts is answering this question without specifically giving a specific answer. And so when the day of Pentecost came, chapter 2... They are sitting around waiting for the promised Holy Spirit. And then it says they hear the sound like that of a mighty rushing wind. Uh, it's hard to imagine the like that part. So I know what a mighty rushing wind sounds like. I'm not quite sure I know what like that, like a mighty rushing wind. In, in other words, there seems to be a distinction being made here. And of course, there has to be because the Spirit of God is not a mighty rushing wind. The Spirit of God is, is unique in his person. And yet as he comes, we notice then verse 2, the house is filled. They are filled with the Holy Spirit, and they, are begin, they began to speak in others' tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And I think this is important, especially when you look at Numbers chapter 11, which we'll see in a moment that the Spirit gives utterance to speak in these other tongues. Verse 4. The next thing you notice is that this brings confusion because now everyone begins to hear this language being spoken, but the confusion doesn't happen because they cannot understand what is being said, like in the Tower of Babel, but rather the confusion happens because they can now understand what each one is saying as it was in their own language. Now, the conclusion that these men arrive at is that these men who are speaking with these tongues are filled with new wine. In other words, they're drunk. And then notice Peter's explanation. Standing, this is uh, verse 14, lifting his voice, he addressed both the confusion and the conclusion. The conclusion's wrong because they are confused. Firstly, he points out, notice what time of day it is. I think that's a strange thing to point out, but I understand why Peter does it. I understand that by pointing out the time of day, um, that it would give an indication that this is not the time of day that people would be drinking. Okay, so Peter perhaps is doing that, but it seems a strange way to address the subject, but he does it that way, and I'm not going to argue with God's word. But then he turns to give the explanation for why this is happening, and he turns and speaks about the prophet Joel in verses 17 through to 21. In other words, that everything that you are witnessing that is happening has been not only promised, but now the promise has been kept. So promises made and promises kept. That God is keeping his promises, and what you are witnessing is the keeping of God's promise. That what God said he would do, he is doing this very day. Today is the day that this promise is being fulfilled. 
Today is the day that this is happening. And then, of course, from this, he goes back into the fact that Christ was crucified to the definite plan and for knowledge of God. Then raised from the dead, of course, ascended into heaven because death cannot hold Christ Jesus in the grave. He quotes from David in verses 25 to 28. And then, of course, uh, as the psalm that we have sung, Psalm 110, where the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand in verse 24. In other words, we're seeing over and over again that everything we see in the Old Testament is now being seen by people in their present day. Now, following this, we're to understand, and this is, I think, the clear message of the whole book of Acts, verse 36, that Jesus Christ is both Lord and Christ. That Jesus is both Lord and Christ. In other words, if you go back just to verse 21, it says, and it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. In verse 36, we read, let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ. In other words, I think the entire message of the book of Acts is to show us that Christ is both Lord and Christ in the power of the Spirit. Why? Because we are to understand, as I've said this many times, who it is that Christ actually is. We're to understand the God that we belong to. And the Spirit is given that we would understand these things. And so, let me point this out carefully. There is no coming to Christ as Savior and then later down the road coming to him as Lord. Okay, I want you to understand what I'm saying, and I'll sort of dress this out a bit more. There is no coming to Christ as Savior, and then in maturity, 10 or 15 years down the road, you then come to Christ as Lord. Now, about 15 or 20 years ago, there was an idea popularized uh, under the term carnal Christian. In other words, the church had to come up with a way of explaining why so many Christians, as it was seen, were living a very carnal life. And the explanation that was given about 20 years ago when it became popular is that it was possible to come to Christ as Savior, as Christ, but then not as Lord. It was possible to come to Christ as your Savior and then not submit to him as Lord. Still be saved, but not recognize his lordship. I think the book of Acts just dispels that idea very clearly in one verse. That no, you're meant to understand from the very beginning that Jesus is both Christ and Lord. There is no coming to him as Christ day one and then coming to him as Lord day 301 or coming to Christ in year one and coming to him as Lord in seven years' time. It, it's just not possible. And yet, of course, whenever people want to try and give a reason for their carnal behavior within the Christian life, they then come up with very terrible theology. And the theology 20 years ago was it is possible to come to Christ as Savior, but not as Lord. No, it's not possible. The very book of Acts is stating right from the very beginning that Christ, that Jesus is both Christ and Lord at the same time. And so when you receive Christ, you are submitting to his lordship. Over all of life, for all of life, over all of your life, every single area comes under the lordship of Christ. At no point... Are you free to do what you want to do as though Christ is not Lord? And so I want you to be quite clear that throughout the book of Acts, the proclamation of Christ is that he is Lord. The proclamation of the gospel is affirming that Christ is Lord over everything. And so now it begins to make sense that when we say those words, I've overcome the world, all of these things are just brought together beautifully. They make sense. 
And so if you have heard or if you have been under the influence of um, that you can come to Christ as Saviour and not as Lord, I want to gently correct you and say it's not true. And it's not true not because I said it's not true. It's not true because verse 36 in chapter 2 says it's not true. That Jesus is both Christ and Lord. And at one of the Bible colleges I taught at back in Edinburgh, we used to have guest speakers. And one of the guest speakers, I won't say who he was or where he came from, but he came from a very big college um, that was known for evangelism and mission. And he was trained at a very big seminary um, that was also very big and well known. I'm trying to be kind to you because you're good people. Um, and he came and he, and he taught for two hours that it was absolutely possible to belong to Jesus as Christ and not to him as Lord. I think that's a total misreading of what the gospel actually proclaims. A total misreading of who Jesus actually is. And so the whole point of the book of Acts is for you to be convinced that Christ, Jesus, is both Christ and Lord. And so as you witness, you are witnessing to and about Christ the Savior and Lord of all. That is your witness of Christ Jesus. That is what you're affirming in the power of the Spirit. Now, the promises is what excite us, because there's nothing better than to see that a promise that God makes, to see how that promise is then fulfilled. And so in the Old Testament, we have both promises made, and in the New Testament, we have promises kept. For every promise of God is yes in our men in Christ Jesus. The first one is the Tower of Babel. Many will link Acts chapter 2 to the events of the Tower of Babel in this sense that there is the confusion of languages. But then what about receiving the law at Mount Sinai? That's linked to Pentecost. And what about Moses in the 70 elders in Numbers 11? That's also must be linked to Pentecost because we, beget, we begin to see the beauty of the promises that God makes being fulfilled in Acts chapter 2. And what about the Feast of Weeks? Well, we have to include that because we need an explanation for why all these people are in Jerusalem. They are there because a feast is taking place. And that also ties in. And Pentecost being 50 days after the Passover. So the link between Babel and Pentecost is the following. It's not necessarily just the reversal of language or rather in judgment, God confused the languages back in Genesis chapter 11. That in judgment, because man wanted to make a name for himself rather than proclaim the name of God, wanted to make a name for himself, God came down and confused the languages in judgment and then scattered the people throughout the earth. And so the reversal is not that God's people have been gathered. I don't think that's the reversal, though that is a picture of reversal because it is the opposite. I think the actual reversal now is that people are going to go out throughout the world, not as scattered people, but as people sent in the power of the Spirit to proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord. In other words, the real reversal is that people are now being spread throughout the world as a blessing to the world, not in judgment. And so the reversal of Babel is seen in the context that they are confused on both occasions, once, because, once in judgment and now in blessing. But the blessing doesn't lead to scattering, it leads to sending. The blessing leads to people being sent out into the world as witnesses of Jesus Christ. And that's the blessing and connection between Babel and Pentecost. The Sinai connection, I think, is a beautiful one because... On Mount Sinai, the people of God received the law about seven weeks, about 50 days after the Passover. But in the same way, the Spirit of God comes 50 days after the Passover, our Passover in Christ Jesus. And so we have this beautiful connection between the law and the Spirit. And Jesus told us that the law would not be disregarded, that, that 
that the law will be fulfilled in him and indeed was fulfilled in him. But in the context of Jeremiah, remember the promise that the law of God would be printed, would be inscribed, would be placed inside of your heart. No longer just written on tablets of stone, but the law would be put into your heart. And so Sinai has a beautiful connection to Pentecost because it's reminding us that the law of God hasn't disappeared as though we're now in a time of grace no longer needing the law. No, not at all. The Spirit of God gives us power to live according to God's holy law. We're not saved by the law, and we're not saved by works, but as people filled with God's grace, Titus chapter 1, the grace of God teaches us to say no to ungodliness. And, that, and therefore, it teaches us to say yes to God, yes to what God has taught, yes to what his law teaches. And so there is a Sinai connection to Pentecost in that the law has been put into our hearts by the work of the Spirit. I find Numbers 11, however, and Moses being under the burden of ministry interesting because Moses comes before God and in Numbers chapter 11 what you begin to see is that the Spirit of God is taken from Moses not that he doesn't have the Spirit upon him anymore but the Spirit is divided it is distributed to the 70 elders and so I think that is a beautiful picture of and foreshadowing what Pentecost actually is that in a wonderful way that as Moses is coming before God in the Lord's service, the 70 elders are now going to be empowered by the Spirit of God coming upon them. Why? For the Lord's service. And what is interesting is that they began to prophesy as the, as the Spirit gave them utterances, as the Spirit gave them the power to do so. And two men who didn't come out to the meeting who are back in their tent um, <clears throat> also begin to prophesy. As, and that's a wonderful example of the Spirit of God reaching out upon the people that it is meant to come upon, that they would then be filled with power in order to do the work that God has given them to do. In other words, this has kind of already happened. Numbers 11 is sort of a foreshadowing of the day of Pentecost, of the Spirit being given to more than just one person, in this case Moses, to the 70 elders, for the work of the Lord's service. Well, here's a consideration I think we need to make. And it's this, that one of the most beautiful things about Pentecost, and I find this in the book of Ephesians also, is how God establishes unity within the church and establishes unity within the world. In other words, if I wanted to create unity, I would make everything the same. And God doesn't do that. God creates unity by making everyone different, <laughs> which is a very odd way of doing it, but God is the only one who can create unity out of differences that he has made. And those differences have been made by God. And then the unity has been brought about by God. And you've heard my illustration about the difference between unity and harmony. Unity is that on a piano you have the black and white keys, they are alongside each other. They're in perfect unity. Now I can play the piano just like my wife, just differently. <laughs> it's my wife plays the piano and I play exactly the same keys, I just play them in a different order. Now, the sound doesn't make the same sound as my wife does. Now, why is that the case? Because order matters. Because when you have order alongside unity, you then have the harmony. And this is what Pentecost brings to the world properly understood, that you're able to have unity with 52 or more different sets, and then out of that differences, you're able to have perfect harmony. Only God, only God, is able to create harmony out of unity because 
the order in which things are meant to be done is correct. In other words, we live in a world where everyone wants to be different. And differences ought to be celebrated. And the truth is, Pentecost is saying they can be. They can be, not sinful ones, not ones that are against God's law, but all the other differences in all the other nations that God has created are brought together in harmony because the dividing wall of hostility is broken down. And so what the power of the Holy Spirit does, the person and work of the Holy Spirit does, is he breaks down the dividing wall of hostility, bringing harmony out of the unity that people then have in Christ Jesus. I mean, think about the types of food that we have throughout the world. Isn't it great to have those differences? Think about the different types of music and traditions that we have throughout the world. We wouldn't want to lose those because in many ways, they are, God created those people. And some of those are glorifying to God. Some of those are not. I understand that. But the point is to recognize that it's not just a case that there is no Jew nor Greek, bond or free. We're all one in Christ Jesus. They are not the only differences that are unified in the person and work of the Holy Spirit because the dividing wall has been broken down. There are hundreds of differences that are brought together. And so in a world where people want to celebrate their difference, you need to understand that the only way that that difference can be celebrated so that you have harmony rather than an awful sound is if that harmony comes via unity and order, and then you have the beauty. Then you have the harmony. That's the only way. And so what Pentecost does is it brings together differences, not sinful ones. They go. They get crucified. They get buried. They get never resurrected again. But the many other differences are beautiful in Christ, in Christ alone. Because Christ is the only one in the person and work of the Holy Spirit. It's the only one who can bring together differences by bringing down the dividing walls of hostility in Christ Jesus. So let me finish with this. Pentecost is most definitely not an afterthought. It is something that God has been showing us from the very beginning, or at least near to the very beginning of his word. But the Spirit of God is given to the church to be witnesses of Christ, to be witnesses of that unity, of that harmony, of that dividing wall being broken down. The Spirit of God is also given to give you assurance that Christ Jesus has overcome the world. The politicians are not in control. Companies are not in control. Banks are not in control. They, they have not overcome the world. Christ has. And those who belong to Christ have overcome the world in him. And therefore, I find it very strange for any Christian in the church to look at the future as if it is pessimistic. That somehow that we are going to lose. I think it's bizarre to think that we can somehow live a life as though things are only going to get worse, especially when you're given a prayer that says God's will is being done on earth as it is in heaven. I just cannot see how that is pessimistic. And so I want you to recognize this morning as you go out in the power of the Spirit that you may be walking down a road thinking that this is the final corner, and it won't be. Okay? You've got another corner after that and another corner after that. Or you're walking up a hill and you think, this is the last hill and I'm at the top. It won't be. Because what God is doing throughout history means that we are to pay attention to the tide and not the waves. Do you understand what I mean? There are too many people that pay attention to the tide. Too many people that pay attention to the waves. And this, this wave is going to kill us all. This wave is going to destroy everything. This wave is going to take us back 100 years. No, no, we pay attention to the tide. And the tide says that God's kingdom is coming. That God's will has been done on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The tide is coming in. So don't pay attention to the ways of society. Don't pay attention to the ways of culture. Don't pay attention to the ways that we see on the news that somehow can distract us.
The truth remains that the tide is coming in. The kingdom of God has come and is coming in its fullness. And we are the very people of God whom God has given his spirit to so that we would know that and proclaim it to the glory of Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let me pray. Father God, we thank you that in you we have overcome the world, but we have only overcome the world because Christ has done so. And you have given us your spirit to fill us with assurance and confidence and power to be witnesses of you and of this truth. In Jesus' name we thank you. Amen.